literally did at one point tie myself to my desk chair. Hold on, you up. tied yourself like you got some rope? And you yeah, tied I yourself. got a rope. I was like, if I'm going to try the Odysseus strategy, let me try it. <laughs> this is AJ Jacobs. He's a four-time New York Times bestselling author who's known as the human guinea pig because he takes on these elaborate challenges. I am a big believer in that it is a numbers game. So I do spend 15 minutes every day brainstorming ideas. They could be book ideas or article ideas. And I am aware 99% of these will never see the light of day and probably shouldn't. A lot of them suck. <laughs> what started back in 2005 with his first book, The Know-It-All, one man's humble quest to become the smartest person in the world. Forget this. He spent 18 months reading the entire encyclopedia in a quest to learn everything in the world. He followed that up in 2008 with The Year of Living Biblically, one man's humble quest to follow the Bible as literally as possible, where you guessed it, he tried to live following the hundreds of rules in the good book. In the books that followed, he continued to chronicle his living experiments covering all areas of life, health, and gratitude. His newest challenge? To unpuzzle puzzles with The Puzzler, one man's quest to solve the most baffling puzzles ever. So that's the way I try to imagine it. If I were a reader, what would I most want? How did you get into the idea of like setting up these life challenges for yourself? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say a couple of reasons. First, they always say, uh, write what you know, write about your life. But I did not have a very interesting life. So I'm like, <laughs> neither, who neither do I. My social media people are like, talk about your life. I'm like, I just work all the time. <laughs> Exactly. I work on it. Yeah. Yeah. I never got thrown in jail. My, my father was not like, you know, a spy or anything. So I thought, well, if I'm going to write, uh, I better try to do something interesting and write about that. So that was one motivation. Another motivation is that all of my projects uh, have an element of uh, uh, trying to make myself better and self-improvement. And uh, so I figure I need a lot of improvement. I am a, I am a fixer upper and I still need lots of improvement. There's always something to work on. So that was another reason why I was like, well, let me try all these different ways to make myself better and write about what works and what doesn't and what is painful and what is delightful and what is embarrassing and what is <laughs> fun. And uh, so that's sort of the origin of um, so at a certain point, it was just a vehicle to help you create content. Create content and try to make myself better, which, uh, <laughs> you know, I, as I, like I say, I need, I need a lot of work. Do, do, um, you, do you, hold on, you say that, but we all need a lot of work and, and that's fine. But like, did you, so your first book, you know, The Know-It-All, One Man's Humble Quest to Become the Smartest Person in the World. Uh, was that going to make you a better person by knowing all this trivia and stuff? Well, that was the big experiment. Does it make my life okay. better? And, and punchline did it? <laughs> well, yes and no. The no version is, you know, the idea was I started to, I read the encyclopedia when there were still encyclopedias in print. Now it's all Wikipedia. Uh, and this was like 20 years ago. Um, I did it partly because my dad uh, loves reading. And when I was a kid, he started to read the encyclopedia, but he only made it up to the middle of the letter B like Bolivia. So I thought, well, maybe it might be interesting to try to finish what he began and remove that black mark from our family history. But I, uh, I would say, okay, so the downsides were I was just filling my brain with so much information that uh, I couldn't contain myself. So I would insert random information into conversation, you know, with, uh, we'd be having a talk and I'd say, Hey, did you know opossums have 13 nipples? And it just uh, drove my wife crazy. So she started to penalize me $1 for every irrelevant fact that I inserted into conversation. So that was the downside. Uh, the upside was among all those facts, if you look at the big picture, there is a lot of wisdom, a lot of takeaways that make my life better. Uh, and just to give you one example, I read about all of human history and uh, do you, do you, do, hold on, I, I got to ask this, though, when I read stuff, um, I'm like someone, for example, here, I had I had Lisa Bill you on the podcast. And so when I read, I underline all of these important things 
mm. because I'm somehow hoping that I'm going to retain the information. And, <laughs> and, and it actually really bothers me knowing every time I read something, I'm like, guys, you got to read this. This is amazing. Oh my goodness. This is so great. And everything I read, I, I react the same way with. And it bothers me that, that the more I learn, somehow I'm forgetting all the stuff too. Like, like I somehow just want to retain everything. As you're oh, working yeah. through the encyclopedia, does it not bother you to know that by the time you're on S, you can't even remember what happened on C? Well, it is funny. Yeah, that is. I definitely have forgotten 99.9% of it. But I will say that 0.1% is quite a bit from the encyclopedia because it's this huge book. So there's always stuff that I remember. And, um, and actually, I have a strategy that I've developed since then, which is that Every book I read, every conversation, every podcast I listen to, I, I have a file called One Thing, and I write down the one thing that I found most interesting, most inspiring, and here I'm opening it up right now. On my, and, um, and I go back to that file all the time. I have it on my iPhone, and like if I'm waiting in line, I'll just look through the one thing. So, so what's an example of something that's like, what's the, what's the last entry point? I'm curious now. All right. So the last one is, oh, I was reading old newspapers and they said they used to call uh, 730, seven and a half o'clock, six and a half o'clock. So, you know, that one is not particularly useful, but it's I love it because it makes you think that people do things differently. There are different ways to do things. It's always we get locked into our our world. Um, oh, here's another one uh, I've re- heard on a podcast. Steven Pinker, the Harvard psychologist, he talked about um, why did streakers go away in the NFL? You remember in like the 80s or 70s, people would streak uh, nude at football games and it stopped because the TV networks decided we are not going to show them. We are going to pretend it never happened. And so his argument is we should do the same for mass shootings. We should not cover them in the media mm. and that will take away people's. Uh, well, that's interesting. In, I mean, in, the media chooses not to typically speak about death by suicide or those types of things. Right. Yeah. Does it, does it diminish it though? You think, does it, I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, well, it's an experiment yet to be run. Uh, yeah. uh, so now why are you reading old newspapers? Well, I was really like, in, like know, what kind of old newspapers? Like, are you like 1955? Let's see what happened to like, I, I love it. I do love it. I, I, I have a New York times subscription and you can search back to its founding and whatever it was, the 1840s. Really? So you can see, yeah, you can see the first time they mentioned, uh, you know, abortion was in the news. So I wanted to know what was the, what was the history of abortion? Uh, so that was fascinating. Uh, I, as I say, what I love is it really provides you with proof that life has changed uh, and we see things in a certain way, but we don't have to. And that to get back to the big wisdom that I took away from the Encyclopedia Project is that the myth of the good old days, we always that phrase, the good old days is just crazy talk because the old days were not good. They were terrible. They were violent. They were um, uh, uh, dangerous, sexist, homophobic. They were um, uh, smelly and disgusting. Uh, you know, I'm looking out. I live in New York City. And if this were a lot of horse, there used to be a lot of horses on, in New York City. <laughs> horse. Yeah. And the horse manure literally not metaphorically, literally was waist high. They would sweep it to the sides of the streets and it was less like waist high piles of horse manure everywhere. Carcasses of, you know, they would uh, they would slaughter animals and just throw the carcasses on the street. It was disgusting. I find that a very inspiring and important lesson that the good old days were not good. So we have a huge amount of problems today, but let's not have false nostalgia for the good old days. And let's remember that progress is possible. Progress is real. We have made tremendous strides in, uh, in uh, life expectancy and, uh, you know, in just in, in kindness towards other groups. And it's disturbing because 
I hear it every day. You re, you look at the news and we're bombarded with the negative stuff and people are like, oh, it's the worst time in history. No, it is totally not the worst time in history. The history sucked. So have a little faith and have a little hope and optimism. Yeah. You know, uh, because of the pandemic is happening and there's different generations. I mean, people can remember back to the polio pandemic of, of, of the 50s and how scared people were and how it was affected or we can think of, you know, there's all these issues and challenges happening in terms of geopolitical crises and wars. And I don't think the 60s during the, uh, you know, the Bay of Pigs invasion and all of these other things. I mean, <laughs> I think there was a lot of scary things happening then as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and you we, go we, back a thousand years or two thousand and it's much worse. Your chance of being killed by violence was like one in three. So, yeah, we I remember are hearing um, a podcast just about light, like someone had had figured out how much of the average person's uh, daily income went towards providing light and how much of a breakthrough lamp oil was. Because now mm -hmm. just for pennies, you could have light. And then when electricity happened and then when mm -hmm. outdoor electricity happened and what I didn't realize even and in, in what you're reminding me of is there was a time where being out in an urban like in a city or being outside after dark was an incredibly dangerous thing because all you had was like moonlight if you were lucky <laughs> right. and you know jack the rippers off in the corners because there were there were other than some lamp posts there wasn't very much going on at night like go home stay home do not leave your house bar the door so true and yeah just the the, the fact that i can read at night is awesome it's fantastic and uh and i'm super grateful and that was actually one of the themes of a later book, which we can get to later in the program or, or not, but it was called Thanks want. a Thousand. And it was all about gratitude and real. I thanked a thousand people who had anything to do with my morning cup of coffee, uh, <laughs> because there are a thousand people who contribute to it. So the barista at the coffee shop, but I went to. And what uh, do they say when you walk and say, Hi, I'm an I'm an author and a and a journalist, and I'm doing this experiment. And so, thank you. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends. You know, I I'd say ninety percent of the reactions were positive. Uh, often, I wouldn't I wouldn't explain. I would just express my gratitude. Okay. Uh, and you know, sometimes I, I would try to do it in person, but sometimes I would cold call the people. So I would, for instance, uh, here's one I called the woman who does pest control at the warehouse where the coffee beans are stored, the coffee that eventually become my coffee. And uh, because again, I just wanted to thank everyone along the chain. And it's amazing how many people it takes. And I said, this may sound strange, but I just want to thank you for keeping the insects out of my coffee. And she said, well, that, that is strange, I suppose, but, but it's very nice. I don't get a lot of uh, gratitude. I don't get a lot of feedback in my job. So thank you for making my day. And then that made my day. It was like a little virtuous circle. And she compared it to a, a reverse uh, a reverse crank call. You know, we're used to <laughs> crank cold calls being so negative. But here I tried to flip it on its head. So you had that. I mean, you had some people I would call and and they would be like, what's good? Is this a pyramid scheme? What are you trying to sell me? <laughs> so it didn't, but I'd say that was really, that was five, 10%. Uh, I think people are generally under thanked in our world. Are you, are you like um, a pretty optimistic guy and that's why you carry out these challenges or, you know, is there a certain amount of like, well, I hope that if I do this challenge, I will find the positivity and the optimism on the other side of it. Yeah, I would say I am not by default optimistic, but I act as if I'm optimistic. And that has been a big lesson of all of my experiments is how the power of acting as if the um, how the power of behavior changes your thoughts. And I love this quote. I wish I had made it up, but I believe the founder of Habitat for Humanity is credited with it. And he said, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. And this goes for optimism. So for instance, I wrote a book about health. I tried to be the healthiest person alive. 
And I would uh, wake up many mornings and I'd be like, what the hell am I doing? And I, this is way over my head. I'm not a doctor and there's, it's too complicated. I can't. But then I would say, all right, well, let me just act as if I'm optimistic. So I would force myself to call the, the top doctor uh, in the nation on you know, heart health or whatever. And uh, or I would call my publisher and say, you know, when we have the book party, let's make it a big book party um, and it'll be the healthiest book party ever. We'll serve kale martinis. And, you know, so I was acting as if I knew this was going to be a big deal and a big success, even though I was filled with doubt. And after a couple of hours of that, it really affects your mind and you become a little more optimistic. So to answer your question, no, I'm definitely the opposite, but, but I've learned techniques to train myself to become more optimistic. Hmm. You know, the health book, for example, you, I think you scheduled a year, but it took you two years to work through. And, right. you know, if we go back you, as, as an author, as a writer, you know, 2004, your first book, 2007, your next one, 2010, a series of essays, uh, 2012, the book on health. Um, and, you know, these are these are big challenges. These aren't <laughs> these aren't, you know, today there's lots of YouTubers who do these like great, crazy, cool challenges, but they're they're jumping into something for like a month. You're committing <laughs> a year. You're committing two years. The, the year of living, living biblically, you, you, <laughs> you live like old school, Old Testament, let's follow all of the laws in the Torah uh, for a year. Uh, how are you like sustaining yourself throughout, as you as you run off to do these things? Oh, yeah. Well, that is that was one of my hardest. See if I can follow. And there because there are hundreds of rules. I mean, it's the Ten Commandments and love your neighbor, but also these hundreds of other less famous rules uh, in the Old Testament about don't shave the corners of your beard and I didn't know where the corners were, so I just let the whole thing grow, and I looked like Gandalf. And uh, but as to your question, it is a huge challenge. How how do I stick to it? I would say one, I'm certainly not perfect. I fell off the wagon dozens of times and broke laws. You know, they say don't gossip, and uh, I live in New York and work as a journalist. So how <laughs> how do I do that? But I was able to cut down on the gossip. So you have, a, have to have a little self-compassion that, you know, you're trying. You're never going to be perfect. Uh, another, I think, important motivating factor is to announce it publicly so that you have some accountability and, you know, everyone's following. So you kind of, uh, it gives you motivation to keep going like, oh, everyone's counting on me yeah. to do this. Uh, so, yeah, there are little techniques Um uh, but it's hard. It is definitely hard to, to take on a mega challenge, which is why I recommend, and I do this all the time in my life. I am a huge fan of life experiments, but they don't know. They're not all like following the Bible for a year. They can be small. They can be a week. They can be a day. They can be, you know, don't gossip for a week or, you know, try to uh, whatever, try to eat vegetarian for a week, see what it feels like. So I am a fan of mixing things up in your life as much as possible. I did this health challenge. Uh, it was a 90 day challenge to try and get six pack abs in my late thirties, never having been athletic really or fit uh, before. And it was really hard, but because I had made this big public commitment and I hired coaches and everyone's counting on me, it was, I was so good in the challenge. And that was a year ago now. So now I'm much heavier than I was then. <laughs> <laughs> so you did get the abs? Uh, I did. I, I was able to cut down to 13% body fat. Um, I was, you know, I, I wasn't 7% like crazy, like, you know, spending a year prepping for this bodybuilding thing. But considering kind of a, always been a fat guy in my life, it was pretty impressive. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Congrats. Yeah, I got, I got, I got really cut and I got lean and I thought I looked amazing. And then, and then slowly it's like, oh, I can try and hold on to it. And then I couldn't. And then I gained some more weight and I gained some more weight. And I've had so many false starts now going like, how could I spend three, four months living so aggressively and hardcore? And then now I can't, I can't even get through a week. So on the, <laughs> coming out of these challenges, you're probably like me where after living a year of biblically, after me of four months, 120 days of living really clean, I ate like 14,000 calories the next day. Like I was just like, <laughs> let's let's go back to old life. But how do you hold on to the things that you want to hold on to while being like saying like, thank God I can get 
rid of the stuff that I don't want to do anymore. But how do you hold on to some of those gains that you had without it just kind of slipping away as the challenge kind of disappears? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And I definitely do. It is a mix with every experiment. I keep some things and I jettison others. So, you yeah, know, as you can see, I shaved my beard, uh, much to the delight of my wife and, and with the health book, you know, I was, I was spending, you know, every waking moment and sleeping moment trying to be healthy. So you can't do that, uh, and hold down a job or have a, a life. <laughs> So uh, that's not an excuse for anyone not to get healthy, though. There. (laughs) Well, that's I mean, part of the lesson I learned was, you know, it's unhealthy to be too obsessed with health. In fact, there's a phrase, a term orthorexia, the unhealthy obsession with health. So don't be too obsessed with health because then you don't get the other benefits of life, such as um, a close circle of friends and family, which is very healthy. Stress is very unhealthy. And if you're too obsessed with health, you become stressed. So anyway, to return to the the question, in terms of keeping stuff, uh, again, I have developed some techniques. Um, uh, One is just to remind myself that this is good for my happiness level and for making me a better person, making my family and, and society happier. So something like gratitude, even though it doesn't come naturally, I, I have rituals, disciplines to force myself to be more grateful, knowing that I, uh, I have to, and actually I was, I, uh, I was a previous guest of yours. I can't remember which one, maybe it was the one about addiction. She was an addiction oh, expert. Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Anna Lemke. Yeah. So she Dop- was great. Dopamine nation. Yeah. Dopamine. Great, great conversation. And she talked about the importance of removing obstacles to your in your future self, um, because we all have pretty bad willpower. We were just not as humans given good willpower. So, and this is I've talked about this many times in my books. It's called the Odysseus strategy is one name for it, because if you remember in the Odyssey, Odysseus he tied himself to the um, mast of his boat so that he wouldn't be tempted to jump in when the sirens started singing. Uh, so that is sort of the, uh, the mega strategy, the meta strategy. And I do it all the time, like, you know, just keeping crappy food out of sight, put it on the top shelf. It could be programs like Freedom, where it, it stops my access to the internet for an hour or two hours or however long I choose. So those are just some strategies on how to keep, how to. So you, yeah. so you bind yourself. I think that was the term that was used, right? Binding. I did actually, at one point I had, did an experiment where I, I tried to increase my attention to monotask, I guess it was called or unitask. So get rid of multitasking because multitasking as Many, many articles of says it does not work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's even the word is a myth because you're you're not really multitasking. You're just quickly switching from one task to another. And every time you switch, there's a startup cost and yeah. you're you're so yeah, the context, super, the context switching, right? It it takes time. Yeah, it takes your brain a few seconds to switch. So for that one, I literally did at one point tie myself to my desk chair. So that I couldn't Hold on, get you up. tied yourself like, like you got some rope and yeah, you tied I got yourself. A rope. I was like, if I'm going to try the Odysseus strategy, let me try it. <laughs> let me do it. So I tied myself and, you know, it, I suppose it's, uh, it was effective in that I couldn't move. I, I had to sit there and do my work. It's a little draconian. Uh, so I, I don't think I would do it, uh, on a regular basis, but sort of more metaphorical tying myself to, um, I think is very effective. I always say when people ask, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I started a company back in 2006, a creative agency that I've been running for 15 years. And whenever people ask me about entrepreneurs as risk takers, I always say, you know, I don't think we start out as risk takers. I think we start out as foolish. You just <laughs> think we can do a better job or that there's an opportunity. So it's not right. And then when you realize 
oh shit, this is like really hard. And it's harder than I thought. And it's gonna take longer than I thought, but then you're in so deep, you don't want to yes. give up. So you just keep going. I have to imagine when you come up with these ideas, um, you know, whether <laughs> whether you're completely sober or you're intoxicated, but when you come up with this idea you're excited about, at a certain point, uh, it's probably just foolishness that then turns to like, oh shit, this is like so much harder than I thought it was going to be. How much do you, uh, I guess, pre-qualify these little right. experiments or challenges before you jump in and commit your life and your wife and family's life to this? Well, it is true. I do have to get permission from my wife. So, cause I do want to stay married, but you're right. I have given actually talks and written about the concept of delusional optimism. And sometimes you, I feel it's a super helpful tool when you're starting a big project, whether it's a startup or one, you know, following all the rules of the Bible, you're like, I can do this. I can do this. Um, I will say I read a very interesting book and you might want to have her on your podcast sometime. It's called The Scout Mindset by Julia Galef. And she argues that entrepreneurs don't need the delusional optimism mindset, that you can have a more realistic mindset. For instance, she talks about how Elon Musk, when he started, I forget which one, Tesla or SpaceX, he's like, this has a 10% chance of success. So he was very clear eyed that it was probably not going to work, but he said, but the payoff, if it does work to me and to society, it'll be huge. So I'm going to commit, I'm going to go all in. So I think there are some people who are able to do this without delusional optimism. And I'm sort of experimenting with that. Now I'm trying to say, you know what, this article I'm going to write, it may never be published. There's a 20% chance it'll be published. But if it does get published, it could be huge. So I'm going to go all in and work on it regardless of the certainty. So it's an interesting balance. Like those are two very um, different approaches and they each have their pros and cons. What do you think? Uh, I'd be interested to know what you think, Mark, about this idea of going into, like if you were a startup and doing it and being like, you know what, this probably won't work, but I'm going to go all in. I, I think it comes from your natural place. So, so for example, you mentioned that you're naturally a little bit more struggle with doubt. You naturally may not be as grateful as you're hoping to be. And so I think it depends on your starting point. You know, uh, I have a friend um, who is just super, not optimistic, but just very positive, very confident, very growth mindset, and just like doesn't judge himself or others. I <laughs> tend to live in fear. I tend to dr judge myself and everyone else. Uh, I, I, I find myself in a fixed scarcity mindset more often than not, and I'm trying to work on that. And so if, if I were to start something going like, hey, there's a 10% chance, I don't look at the 10% chance. I'm busy staring at the the ninety percent failure rate, and mm, and if right. I didn't have a little bit of blind optimism, if I didn't have a little bit of that that fear and feeling that I'm actually foolish, like I'm just thinking so big, and like am I crazy for thinking this could work? Because I already live in the place of fear and doubt mm. that I have to rely on the other thing. I think if you're in a really uh, either confident state or maybe you're just more mature <laughs> than I am. You know, I don't know if I would say that Elon Musk is more mature than I am, but he certainly uh, approaches business <laughs> a little bit differently than I do. Right. And uh, maybe he doesn't mind uh, uh, those risks. <laughs> that's a really, I think that's a very interesting point. It may be based on your personality, right? And I love what you say about this, the deficit mindset or the scarcity mindset, which is, because that was one thing, one of the main themes of, the gratitude book was trying to get over that by realizing that we focus on that, that three or four things that go wrong every day yeah. instead of the hundreds of things that go right. And we also have the mindset, you know, I will be happy when X happens. And then X happens and you're like, oh, happy for 30 seconds. I'll be like, well, I'll be really happy when Y happens. So yeah, that is a that is a, the, a terrible treadmill that I hope to hop off of. Well, the, you, you know, they say you got to love the journey, right? Not the, mm -hmm. not the result, not the outcome, not final destination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, you've and in done, fact, oh, go ahead. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Well, I was just going to say my most recent book is all about puzzles. And that is one of the big themes of my book is that you have got to love the, the journey of solving the puzzle, which this you may never was, solve. This yeah. is what I was going to ask you, though, because oh, perfect. Because um, I have to imagine there's something very, I, I know enough about the, the authoring process to know that like, just the amount of back end work, you know, you write your first draft, and then it goes back and goes forth. And you know, and then and then you make changes, and you make edits, and then you're like, yes, it's done, it's submitted, and then like, 14 months later, you're doing promo <laughs> on a book. Uh, so, so it's not like maybe it's like hot off hot off the presses. And I always say that that if you want to know what what an author has gone through three years ago, just look at what their current book is about. That's but true. but you know the the journey has to be something that I guess you enjoy. Like, like you're, you're picking these challenges. They are long challenges. Let's take the puzzles, for example. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of time or, or you know what, even more interesting to me, let's take the book that you started to talk about, but maybe you didn't even complete the idea of truth, right? You were, you were really into it and it caught my attention because I am so fascinated with, with how, what is truth and how do you know what truth is? And it's so perspective based and there's my truth versus your truth versus all of these things. And how can we define what truth is. So you go down this journey, you have to enjoy the journey, I, I suppose, but are you more addicted to just like writing it and getting it out and getting this over with? I would say no. I mean, that was that was the problem with that book you mentioned where I was trying to figure out how do I know what I know? And it's still to me a fascinating topic, but I was, I was a, miserable while writing it. And as you say, like enjoying the journey is is huge. And of course, even for my favorite journeys, I'm not going to enjoy every moment. It's There's going to be a lot of pain and obstacles and annoying feedback. But yeah, like picking uh, up sheep shit, you know, when you're yeah, biblically, right? Exactly. <laughs> but I do have to, I feel I have to appreciate the, the total journey. So yeah, I definitely cannot have the, have the mindset I just want to get it over with and get it out. Otherwise, I'm miserable. I will say as a writer, there are several aspects to my job. One is the creation of ideas, coming up with what book or article am I going to write? Another is the research, which for me, of course, is huge because I'll spend a year talking to people or, you know, living like a biblical person or doing puzzles. Then there's the actual writing, sitting alone and crunching it out. And then there's the publicity and promotion. I will say, I like three of the four of those. Let's, act, let's play a game. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> which do you let's think? Let's guess which one is it? I, can, I, think, uh, I, think, I think the most people who love their craft aren't a huge fan of the promotion side of things. I don't know. Weirdly, no, I am, I am different. I actually... Uh, see the promotion. I used to hate the promotion, but then I decided to reframe it and be like, you know what? Promotion and publicity can be creative. I can come up with creative ways to promote my books, whether it's like, you know, for the gratitude one, I send a thousand handwritten thank you notes. So I find that uh, enjoyable. I do not like sitting alone in my office, typing the words uh, because it's, it's very solitary. You don't get any feedback. So I have had to reframe that as a way to make it more enjoyable. And one of the ways that I learned from writing the puzzle book was to try to think of writing the book as a puzzle. And the chapters were pieces of the puzzle. And I, how do I arrange it? And, and then make it an intellectual challenge and game as opposed to let me just sit there and grind it out. Yeah, that's so that's so cool. So the idea generation side of things, and I love the idea of writing a book. <laughs> I think many people do, right? I love the idea of the being idea. a concert pianist exactly. as well. You know, like, <laughs> but but I I don't play piano. Um, so I, I love the idea of writing a book, and I I think for most of us, we kind of assume that what we're reading is like is like draft one, and mm. I find it reassuring to know that when I'm comparing, you know, some of my writing stuff that's published like again it's gone through as you the idea the research the writing the editing the the rewriting the packaging like there's just a lot of time and a lot of hands and what we're looking at is actually version 21 as opposed to just version one 
and that I shouldn't hold my, beat myself so much up, up for version one of things. But the ideation, the research, I'm wondering though, you know, like if you're reframing promotion, like have you ever thought of writing a different way than than you're used to writing? Like, can writing not be a communal exercise? Can it not be done on video or dictated? Can it not be done on cards where you're just moving stuff around? Like, like I'm I'm always so interested in in people who approach a craft a certain way because they have their process, but with the pandemic, what it's shown me is like, hey, maybe there's a way we can throw everything on the table and actually just approach these crafts in a totally different way. Have you ever thought of trying to run an experiment on even how you approach writing? I have, and I think it's a great idea. I've never really followed through on it, but you're inspiring me to do it. <laughs> one, one way I thought was just... Um, what would it be like to do sort of live streamed writing so that everyone could see my screen as I typed my book and uh, what would, how would that affect it? And maybe even have a social element. So like, as you're writing, you know, people can comment, Oh, I like that phrase. Oh, that one sucks. I mean, it might be crippling. It probably would be, but it might be interesting. So uh, that oh, was just one is... experiment I thought of, but That's I agree. Cool. I love the way you think that, you know, why not me mess with the process and see yeah. what happens. I know when Rob Bell released a book, uh, an author who writes about spirituality and, and Christianity and things like that, right. he released a book a few years ago about the Old Testament that I believe he put out as chapters on like a blog or Tumblr or something. And he just, and then eventually he hit the end and he realized, oh, there's a book here. <laughs> and like, uh, uh, so that would be curious. My friend Evan Carmichael is working on a book. I got access to a Google document that he shared within with one of his like membership groups. So so he has like a group of about a hundred students. And he just shared an open document and said, please don't edit anything, but comment anything you want. And there's like there's like people having conversations on <laughs> like in the comments section on the book that is still being written in progress, which right. I think uh is a super, you know, as long as you again you're you're confident enough to not have to feel like you have to accept everyone's changes or requests. It seems right. like a really uh, social way to approach writing. I love that. And a friend of mine just wrote a book, which is fantastic. It's coming out in August about what we owe the future, about how we should be more mindful of our, our great, 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 great grandkids. Um, but he, as like your friend, he approached it in a really novel way. He almost turned it into like a, um, that he was the CEO of the book, but he delegated research to like 10 people and fact checking because 95% of books are not fact checked at all. I actually hire my friend to do fact checking. Even with my friend um, fact checking it, there, there are mistakes because Facts are hard to pin down. Uh, so he, uh, his fact checking, you know, he had like, I don't know how many, but 10 people working on fact checking so that he, because he just wanted to make it as accurate as possible. So that's another way to envision it. Uh, and I love, yeah, I am a huge fan of re-envisioning these processes that we take for granted. That is cool. Turning to your new book, uh, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I, it's funny to me because when you look at your string of, of, of that I'm aware of, and I know you do lots of articles and you're the, you know, editor at large for Esquire and there's tons and tons of stuff that you've done that I haven't had a chance to dig into. But when you look at the books again, it's like challenge, challenge, challenge. And then we got the puzzler. And when I got a copy of it, I was like, this seems very different. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, why, part, why, it why this book now? Well, it, first of all, I, I do think that it is sort of in line with the challenges because I try to tackle the most baffling puzzles of all time. Uh, and I do think puzzles are a self-improvement technique. They make you better thinkers. They make you uh, better reasoners, communicators, uh, even more compassionate, I feel, because you have to get in the mindset of someone else when you're solving some puzzles. Uh, but this came about... Uh, Partly because uh, I'm a lifelong puzzle addict. I've always loved puzzles. I did crosswords and I made mazes as a kid. And you've the been, open you've been mentioned in in crosswords as well, like as a clue. <laughs> right. Well, this was sort of, I also 
for me, having an opening story uh, to a book is, uh, I wouldn't say half the battle, but it's a, it's an important element. And I was like, hey, I, I think I have a good way to open this book, which is just what you said. It was the story of about uh, five years ago. I was the answer to a clue in the New York Times crossword puzzle. The, uh, the clue was yeah, know-it-all author A.J. Blank. And I was like, as a word nerd, I was like, oh, this is the greatest moment of my life. This is the holy grail. You know, did you, my, did you cut it out? Did you put it up on course. the wall? Oh, yeah, we framed yeah. it. But there's some twists to the story, because after that, I was um, after it came out, my brother in law emailed me and he he did congratulate me. But he also pointed out that I appeared in the Saturday edition of the New York Times crossword puzzle. And for those who know, Saturday is the hardest puzzle of the week. It is like... It's progressively harder each day, right. I believe, right? I watched a documentary on it a, a bunch of years ago. And if, if I'm remembering correctly, like Sunday's the easiest and then each day it gets slightly harder. Yeah, Monday is the easiest. Sunday Monday, is okay. sort of in the middle. It's a, it, but But Saturday is definitely the hardest and all of the answers are totally obscure there are things that no one is supposed to yeah, know so you're like you're like thanks brother-in-law thanks for yeah. pointing out that i'm in the obscure one <laughs> exactly so that was then i was crushed um were i you did really were you really well crushed? no no okay. i was fine but it was uh you know it was sort of a, a fun little uh but a fun story to tell and then i told that story on a podcast on it was a Stephen Dubner's podcast, Freakonomics podcast, and he. It happened that one of the creators of the crossword puzzles was listening, and he decided to rescue me and put me in earlier in the week uh, on a Tuesday, which is not Monday, but Tuesday, still pretty good. So uh, he redeemed me and put me in Tuesday where, where truly famous people appear. And I did not belong there, but I was delighted. And I was like, oh, this is a fun story. New to goal. Like you you got to hit every day of the week now. <laughs> right? sure. I'm two, two sevenths there. That's right. <laughs> you, need, you need your Monday. You need your, you need your through Friday and, or uh, other than Tuesday and then Sunday. You got to pick it up. Let's go. All right. I'm trying. I'm out there. <laughs> So, so how do you approach uh, writing like a book on on puzzles? And and the reason I'm asking this is because I, as I was thinking about this, is like I like puzzles, I like I like puzzle games, and I like challenges, and I like these other things. As long as they're not too hard, if they're too hard, I just get really pissed off and frustrated. <laughs> but if they're too easy, I'm just like, oh, this is really easy. That's not like mm -hmm. so. So the thing for me, like with puzzles, is is a bit like books. I tend not to pick up a book because. It's like, well, what if I get halfway through the book and I don't like it? And it's just like, I, it's just the opportunity cost. Mm, but, right. but, you know, there are puzzles, as you mentioned, that have never been solved. Like, I don't find that fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't find, I don't find the thought of spending years working on this thing. So like, how do you approach a book on, on puzzles? Well, one, one method uh, is just to try to get inside the mind of the reader. What would the reader find most fun? So... With that, I made sure to actually include hundreds of historical puzzles, like the first crossword puzzle, so you can actually do it. I I teamed up with a friend of mine who's a puzzle maker, like one of the best in America, and he made 20 new puzzles. Uh, I also thought maybe it would be fun for the reader if there was an, a secret code and contest in the book. So in the book's introduction there is a secret code and if you put that code into the puzzler.com website there was a contest of where the first one to solve these like 30 really crazy puzzles would be uh, would get ten thousand dollars so that actually is over someone did claim it but uh but the puzzles are there and and they're amazing so i would recommend just checking them out um, even if uh, there's no prize at the end. I, as a reader, I like when people go on these adventures and take me along with them. So I, I made sure that each chapter had a crazy adventure where I could like, you know, when I went to Spain and, and participated in the World Jigsaw Puzzle Championship. And then the, uh, 
another as, strand. As Team USA, right? We team team USA. 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 We did not win, but we tried. Given second last place, second I think. Second to last. That's right. But not last. Not last. And then the fi- final strand, well, or one of the final strands is I want some takeaway for the reader on how it will make their life better. And I do think puzzles taught me, you know, dozens of life lessons on how to solve problems uh, or just how to approach life. Um, As we were talking about, like, you got to enjoy the journey. And that was a big lesson for my puzzle experiment. So that's the way I try to imagine it. Like what, if I were a reader, what would I most want and find fun? How do you know what's a good idea and a bad idea? You know, like, how how do you know if, how do you know if uh, martinis made of spinach and kale is going to be a good <laughs> idea or not just because you had them well yeah you never know for sure and you have to be okay with uncertainty but uh, i am a big believer in that it is a numbers game and uh so i do spend 15 minutes every day brainstorming ideas uh they could be book ideas or article ideas or just like random ideas like that'll uh, and i i am aware and i'm Fine with the fact that 99% of these will never see the light of day and probably shouldn't. A lot of them suck. And I'm okay with that <laughs> uh, because I, I once did an article on how to be creative. And, and one of the, one of the findings of research scientists was it, it is a numbers game. Yeah. Even, you know, Mozart wrote some crappy stuff. Uh, Picasso painted some crappy stuff. No one's, no one's going to be batting a thousand. Uh, so it's all about like generating as many ideas as you can and then trying your best to figure them out. And as to how I figure out which are good, I have a couple of heuristics. Uh, as I say, none of them are perfect. One is if this is an idea that stays with me, like I came up with it a month ago and I, I keep coming back to it like, oh, maybe there's something there. Another is I'm a big fan of telling people my ideas. I used to be very paranoid, but now I like to tell people, oh, I'm thinking of writing a book about X and just look at their eyes and see, you know, because you do, can do, tell. Do you like, do you like the like, that's weird. And you're like, okay, good, good. I'm onto something weird. <laughs> or do you look for like the little spark of curiosity or interest? Yeah, I would say the spark. of Okay. Curiosity. I mean, <laughs> not, the, weird... not the like, that is your idea. Okay. <laughs> right. Weird is good in general, but it shouldn't be your first. Uh, it should be like, that's fascinating and weird. You want that combination. Uh, so, cause weird could just mean like, I'm not interested. It's too So, so the idea has to live with you a bit and it has to be something that, that just keeps coming back to you. You talk about it with people and you're looking for a little bit of buy-in from them, which is right. cool. Uh, also, I, I feel it has to be something that will make the world better or make my life better, or hopefully both. Uh, because if I'm going to be, first of all, if I'm going to be spending two to three years on it, I can, I don't want to do something that's just trivial. Uh, and I also think sometimes they want pure escapism, but I like to combine almost you know, entertainment with, uh, uh, with something that's going to make their life better. Uh, you know, I don't want to say education because that sounds didactic. That sounds but, boring. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, you know, the whole, uh, you want to mix the, um, mix the sweet and the, the nutritious so that you get both. Yeah. What does your day look like these days now? So like, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned um, being very intentional with your 15 minutes of ideation you mentioned that you're very intentional with gratitude. Um, you know, coming out of this health stuff, I, I have to imagine that that you focus on, you know, not too much on stress and on movement and other things. But do you, do you kind of have a daily routine that that works for you? Yeah, like I I said, the, the morning is 15 minutes of uh, ideation, but also I do I send a, a thank you note to my mom. I have a whole list of sort of a checklist of things to do. Um, every, every day, every morning. Yeah. Uh, so one of, uh, I'll look at it. Uh, one is, um, to yeah, send the grateful. I do my, my push ups. Um, I try to, um, I try to be very intentional about my information intake. Okay. Because- so you turn on Fox news first thing in the morning, right? Okay. Gotcha. 
<laughs> well, no, but one of the one of my sources is actually called Ground News, which I recommend because it is um, it basically categorizes news. It shows you what the right wing media is covering and what the left wing media is covering. And oh, it's got this thing called blind spot. So you can see because I, you know, I'm sort of traditionally more on the left wing liberal side. Uh but it's a bubble. So like, I love seeing what the right wing is covering. Um, I used to, when I, when I, when I used to commute a lot every day, I would listen to um, the politics podcast or um, uh, the daily podcast from NPR. <laughs> and I would also listen to, um, Oh gosh, I don't remember the, the, the guy's name who was with Breitbart. And then he left to start his own, the daily wire. Um Oh, uh, it wasn't. Um, neo he's like a neoconservative guy who's like in his 30s. Not Tucker Carlson. Maybe no. Matt Walsh. Uh, really, yes. Anyway, I would listen to both of them. Um, ben Shapiro. Oh, yes. I would listen right. to Ben Shapiro and NPR the same day back to back. And my nice. goodness, my goodness, was it a different perspective <laughs> totally. on, on the it's day of the world. And I was like, I loved I loved like being able to analyze it and really see like really see the spin on things. But it just became too stressful for me. Ah. <laughs> it's just like it was just like I couldn't I couldn't do it for more than like six months. <laughs> that is funny. Well, I think it's a great strategy and a great experiment. I hope everyone tries that. And you might want to look at ground news because, you know, and that way you don't have to commit to listening to a whole it. You can just <laughs> you're saying through. that way you don't have to commit to listening to Ben Shapiro. All the time. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so that um, yeah, that I love. And and then after, you know, all these things take about an hour and a half. And then I do try to structure the day. So I'm like, I'm gonna spend an hour working on, say, this column about. I have a friend who has a history podcast and he wants me to do be a guest and do the history of puzzles. So I just spent an hour this morning plotting out like the greatest moments in puzzle history. Uh, or, um, and I do try to batch my calls. So do that you feel like as a creative, as an, like I would consider you creative as a creative, as an author, um, as a professional, do you feel like, do you have this like semi-retired feel about you or it's just kind of like, oh, I just kind of do what I, what I want. Like it's still work. It's still effort. It's not always fun, but does it kind of have this like dabbling feel about it? Or are you like the person who goes like, I sit down for three hours. I write 2000 words. I like, like grind my way through things. Yeah, that's a good question. I wonder, I would say, I still see this very much as a job and that I have to structure it myself. Even though I work from home, I have to like have, you know, here's my schedule for the day. Otherwise, it's so easy to fritter the way the day with doom scrolling and like, you know, just chatting on the phone. So that is, I, I do try to be very disciplined. Um, on the other hand, because I think everything is complicated and nuanced, there is this, um, a friend of mine, wrote a book on uh, on sort of delight, the concept of delight mm. and how it, we, we overlook it and we need to focus more on. Uh, and she even has a nice little life hack where when something nice, when she goes for a walk and sees something, a beautiful leaf or whatever, she'll actually say, put her finger up in the air and say, delightful, uh, <laughs> which is very, you know, it's odd and quirky, but I like uh, it. it's fun. Yeah. It reminds you, hey, there are delightful things. And so we were talking about the word dilettante and how that word has a very negative connotation, someone who dabbles, but it actually, the origin is from the word delight. So there is an element of me that wants to be more of a dilettante and just try to delight and dabble in different things. So those are attention. Those are two sort of forces that um, I'm trying to balance. Yeah. Cause I've, I, I don't know if you've ever studied your energy through the day, but, but, you know, there's certainly times where I'm like really focused and I tend to be better in the mornings. And, um, but I've realized about myself, I just love puttering. Like, like I love, I love spending two or three hours on this and then spending two or three hours on that. And, and if I can structure my day where I'm moving from thing to thing to thing in kind of an organized fashion day after day after day, I get stuff done. But, mm -hmm. but I, I just, you know, my wife even says it on a Saturday or on a Sunday, I got lots of stuff to do all week, all the time. I got lots of stuff to do, but, but if I can just putter my way through from this project to that project and what have you, like, 
that to me is so much fun, but I have to make sure that I'm not just, uh, again, living this like semi-retired life that doesn't really right. exist. Well, oh. it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I like your idea of sort of structured puttering, like, uh, you know, you can putter, but you have to be a little disciplined about it. Well, yeah. Cause you talk to someone who's retired, you know, someone, maybe my parents age and, uh, and it's like, Oh, what did you do? And it's like, oh, I had the busiest day. Oh, really? What? And it's like, well, and they list off a few things and you're like, <laughs> okay, like go into the, go into the shop, uh, took a few hours. Right. Cool. Okay. That's something like that's, that's puttering to me. So, so yeah, if you could like, if you can, if you could move from thing to thing, but just kind right. of breeze in and out in these two or three hour windows. And, and there's probably some kind of productivity structure that even says like, this is the the method that you use, but, right. but well, you know, well, it is funny. I mean, I had that sensation in my early twenties. I was, I was unemployed and I never felt busier. I was like, how do people have jobs? Like, <laughs> and I, cause I was just running errands. This was, I guess, before Amazon. Um, but I do feel there's that phenomenon of, you know, your you will fill your day uh, no matter what. So you do have to be intentional about it uh, uh, so that you can yeah. get as much interesting and productive and fulfilling work while still having that feeling of, of flow. And, and do you, do you do structured, this. like, I know you 15 minutes creative ideation, that's cool, but do you give yourself time to just think through things? Like, let's say that you're working on the structure for the book or you're, you're attacking a chapter to me, like writing is like writing, 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 delay. Yeah. but like, do you ever just sit back and go like, I'm going to give myself the hour or two hours or however long it takes to kind of just work through this mentally? Or does that feel like it's not working? <laughs> No, my method of writing is very much, I never just sit down and write. Some writers can do that, um, especially fiction writers. I am much more a planner. So I, I do a very, I start out with an outline, just a very skeletal outline. So here are the four ideas I want to cover. And then I just fill that in. And so I have like 15 outlines that get more and more detailed, like I'm filling in phrases and ideas, and it's almost like building, you know, from from a skeleton and adding flesh and muscles until it's finally ready for me to just write through. Um, but by that time, I have 90% of it already laid out. That is so interesting. You know, I went to film school uh, to become an editor. And when I launched my creative agency, you know, I was an editor and, a, and, and kind of a producer or sort of strategist. Um, and so what one thing I always loved about being an editor is like, I had to work with what I was handed. Mm. And so like, I, I'd be given these assets, uh, you know, it's either a photo, it's a video, it's, uh, it's, it's audio, it's like, there's a message or there's a visual, I'm given these assets, and I have to construct something. Now there are holes. And when there are holes in it, I could always go back and ask people to bring me more stuff, or I can mm. invent more stuff, I can create more stuff. But you always have to start with like this groundwork of what am I working with? Mm. And as you're describing it, to me, it like the process makes total sense from an editing point of view of like, what have I got to work with? Oh, yeah. there's some blanks. How do I fill in the blanks? Oh, there's some more blanks. And, and you're just kind of moving things around until it kind of feels right. Yeah, I love that. I mean, in fact, when I, it reminds me when I, my son, who hates to write more than I do. Uh, <laughs> also I, a, a professional author. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I don't think that's where he's going to go, but uh, he's very talented. Uh, but he says, you know, he's always like, he wants to have that first draft be, be perfect. And yeah. I say, no, like, think of it as a potter. You've got to get the clay out there so you have something to mold. So just vomit it out, vomit out that first draft. And then we've got the clay and then you can go back and make it good. Do you subscribe to the, um, you know, write, write drunk, edit sober approach? Or no? <laughs> I, I find alcohol is, um, is diminishing returns. I actually do <laughs> think, uh, I never write drunk, but I do often have a glass, like a half glass of wine. Um, cause there are some studies that it sort of loosens up the, the frontal cortex and makes allows you to make connections. But I find after one glass, the then <laughs> diminishing returns, hugely diminishing returns. Yeah. So it's I would, not, it's just the productivity tanks, even if that one creative idea happens to come out of it. Exactly. 
So yeah, I would say I, I maybe uh, I would subscribe to like, you know, write with a very small light buzz and then edit sober. Very cool. So what's next for you then? Like, I am so excited to, to be able to see what's, what's in the pipeline. Like, where are you out of this, you know, idea, research, writing? You're obviously promoting the current book. Yeah, but I'm still does doing that mean that. that you're already doing the idea and the research on the next thing, or or do you give yourself I am time? doing. I haven't. I haven't settled for sure. I mean, I have okay. a contract to do another book, but it's un unnamed and topic to be determined. DVD secret. DVD. <laughs> well, it's not actually a secret. I just have a bunch of like you know quarter baked ideas, and I'm just trying to explore which ones work best, and and uh, also figuring out the process of deciding. So I may write an article based on a couple of the ideas and see if those get any traction. That might be one way, but yeah, I haven't decided for sure. You should should launch a YouTube series kind of like dragon's den, or I think in the States they call it shark's tank. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, where, where you and, and maybe a few other people put together a panel where people can come in and pitch to you the, the idea of, you know, what challenge, you should take on. <laughs> I like that Shark Tank, but for my next book, yeah, yeah that's yeah, good. For yeah, go ahead and just just open source it and and, and see what comes of it. And maybe <laughs> maybe do a contest or a vote where people are force you to do a challenge. That oh yeah, well I did know, it's actually. Like Cody McBoatface, right? <laughs> yeah, that was fun. I have actually thought or even gone down the road a little with yeah, uh, my crowdsourced life. Uh, is uh you know was the title i was thinking and have people they weigh in on every decision i make like what should i have for dinner and everyone way you know <laughs> they weigh in so uh That's funny. yeah that might be something to explore very cool well aj jacobs thank you so much for joining me for the hour last question that i have for you uh for you at the end of the day what does it all come down to uh i would say uh Making, I don't know, this is cheesy, so you can edit I this love cheesy, make, man. I love cheesy. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to say it. Yeah, just making the world a better place. Making the world. And and I feel that it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a, um, if I can make my life better and the world better, so you get those two things going simultaneously. I guess there are ways where you could make your life better and the world worse, uh, but then I'd feel like, uh, like a dick. So, <laughs> so you want the sort of the combined, the sort of the non-zero sum win-win idea of, can you make your life better and other people's life better? And maybe that is why I love my job is that I do feel I'm able to do both when I'm successful. I mean, I don't, I don't live in your shoes, but from the outside, you, you get to spend your time creating great work and trying all of these new things, making the world a better place, as you said, plus you, yourself, your family, your legacy. I mean, that's that's what I think most of us dream that we could spend our time doing, our days cool. doing exactly what you're doing. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for what you do and getting these wonderful ideas out. Uh, and uh, again, yeah, the, the one for the addiction specialist um, uh, was definitely one that Uh, a lot of takeaways that made my life better. So I appreciate it. 